This is a Momentum Media production. Welcome to the Smart Property Investment Show, the podcast by investors for investors. Well, good day, everyone. It's Liam Garman here, Managing Editor of Real Estate at Momentum Media, the brand that brings you the Smart Property Investment Show. And a lot of our readers will be pretty up to date with the data that's coming out around property prices right around Australia. And in particular, one thing that's been looming large has been the skyrocketing prices in Brisbane, in Queensland, that has made now Brisbane the second most expensive city in Australia. And I thought to myself, self, I want to learn a little bit more about this. Scratch the surface, understand why investors are hurting to Brisbane and why Brisbane seems to be the place to be at the moment. And so, on this journey, I've called the experts and they're going to walk me through the Brisbane property market and some incredible market intelligence that you need to know more about listening to this podcast at home. And I'm joined by the one and only Greg Vadillo, co-owner and buyer's agent at Advocate Property Services. Greg, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Liam. Thanks for having me today. No, and thank you for joining me. This was, and for our listeners at home, this was a very last minute thing because Greg actually got a one hour lead time to join me on this podcast because we had a few scheduling changes. And so called up Greg, but we've got a great theme, a great topic to discuss today because investors are hurting to the Brisbane market. Greg, you work with a lot of investors and home buyers that are looking to expand into the Brisbane market or are buying in the Brisbane market. Why are buyers buyers entering the Brisbane market? Can you talk us through this? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Liam. There are lots of reasons why buyers are moving to the Brisbane market. It's always offered really good rental returns. So in comparison to so the rental high rental yields, so purchase price compared to rental returns, it's got very low vacancy rates, some of the lowest in the country. And that's largely due to the high interstate migration that Brisbane's enjoying. So Brisbane has always had very high interstate migration, in fact, the highest in the country. It's not the highest international migration, but definitely the highest interstate migration. So, you know, a lot of people move into Australia, they come to Sydney or Melbourne or some other areas. You know, up until recently, Sydney and Melbourne were, well, still are quite unaffordable and found that, you know, Brisbane was previously offering a more affordable lifestyle. But as you just mentioned, it has overtaken Melbourne now for median house prices or median dwelling prices. So, but there's a lot of other reasons, a lot of gentrification happening in Brisbane, a lot of development, some really huge developments there, Queen's Wharf, Howard's Wharf, just to name a couple of them. Brisbane also now has Australia's largest airport per square kilometre, the square metre. That's so, a yeah, fact. So land wise, Brisbane, yeah. most people don't realize that, but Brisbane does have the largest airport in the country. Yeah, right. And it's still, it's still expanding. A lot of people get excited by the Olympics as well. Mm. And look, the Olympics are great. You know, it's a three week advertisement for the city, which will include Southeast Queensland. So, some of the events are in Sunshine Coast and the Gold Coast. It's a free ad for the area for three weeks with the mm. whole world watching. But so maybe it's a bit unfair for yeah. us to only say that the Brisbane market is skyrocketing because, yeah, as you pointed out, that that kind of southeast Queensland corridor, I, yeah, that's a good way of putting it, you you do have the Gold Coast, which is likewise seeing some some huge returns and growth in the Sunshine yeah. Coast as well. What are you seeing? Are a lot of investors going to those markets as well? Uh, look, yes, definitely they are, and and both those areas have performed extremely well. I personally still encourage Brisbane over those areas, even though I would love to live on the Gold Coast or, or the Sunshine Coast myself, but purely more for the more diverse jobs, better employment opportunities. So for investors, I still feel Brisbane's probably slightly better than Sunshine Coast or Gold Coast. Yeah, um, it's probably a bit of a bit of a safer market as well in terms of like you were saying yeah. with, the, with the job prospects and more diversified economy. I mean, we already saw in New South Wales the New South Wales government ordering all their public servants back into the office five days a week. So the question could also be extended to, well, how many people sold up in Brisbane, moved out to the Gold Coast, but now as we see life becoming normal again, people yeah. herding back to the major cities. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Are we also seeing like one thing that I know you and I have discussed quite extensively in the past is rent vesting. There'd be a lot of first home buyers or well, yeah, first home buyers in particularly Sydney and up until recently Melbourne that would be looking to buy in the Brisbane market. Are you seeing a lot of demand in your business for that? Absolutely. Yep. So one of the most recent clients, um, obviously without going into too much detail, young person, single, on a good wage, is renting in Chatswood, went to a mortgage broker, was given a limit of 750000 mm. as what she could borrow, and she couldn't find anything, obviously, that she liked for the lifestyle that she wanted here in Sydney. Mm. And so she decided that she wanted to invest that money. Yeah. And so she did. She bought she bought a house at Chicken Subdivide up in in Brisbane, about 30 minutes from the city, 30 mm. minutes from the CBD. So, yeah, I'm seeing that a lot. That's just one example. At the moment, I've probably got about three clients that are looking to invest but don't own their own home. Yeah. And purely because they can't afford to buy in Sydney what they would want to live in mm. themselves. It's a pretty interesting case study. I mean, like if you're a single borrower, so it's a single borrower, right? It's an individual. Yeah. So like a seven hundred and fifty thousand dollar borrowing capacity for an individual is actually quite high. You know, they yeah. they, they must be on a decent wicket. Yes, so, but you're not getting yeah. anything in the city market for that. No, that's right. So um, yeah, she's on a very good wicket. Yeah, yeah. She's for for people that listening to this podcast that are looking to dip their toe in the Brisbane market, but. They might not understand the state. They might not understand the city well enough. So they're a little bit yeah. nervous to have a go. Who might be first home buyers, for example, and saying, well, yeah. we can't afford Sydney. Let's look in Brisbane. What major tips would you have for people yeah. that, are, that are looking to dip their toe into rent vesting? What should they be looking for? What makes a good investment property versus not a good investment property in the Brisbane market? Yeah. Okay. I'm personally a big believer in investing in houses over apartments. Yeah. Every investment strategy has their pros and cons or advantages and disadvantages. And, you know, units do offer a slightly higher rental return than what a house would. However, capital growth-wise, historically, and I feel personally, in my own opinion, but I feel that into the future, houses will always have better capital growth than units. Yeah. And there's lots of things you can – houses offer you a lot of flexibility that units don't necessarily. Yeah. Best way to make money in property is to renovate before you sell, whether it's a small cosmetic renovation or something a bit larger. And so with units, you can renovate internally. And, you know, I know a lot of people who have made money flipping units, but not as much money as you can make flipping a house because obviously with a house, you can landscape, you can render, you can change the appearance, the street appeal of a house. Yeah. With, with a unit, you would need to get onto the, on, onto the strata committee. You'd need to go to their meetings. You need to convince everyone. You need to have the sinking fund. And, you know, it's quite unlikely that that's going to happen. So I personally, you know, for investors, I would always recommend a house over a unit. So if I go back to my client example, 750000 not really going to buy much of a house in Sydney for that. Mm. Whereas in Sydney, we bought a house that she can actually subdivide into two Two blocks. It's already been approved by council. Yeah. And like I said, it's about she's about 28 to 32 minutes from the Brisbane city. Mm. So that would be my number one tip is I would look for houses. And there are ways that you can increase rent on a house as well so that you can equal to or even overtake what a unit might offer. Not for everyone, but, you know, things like Airbnb, uh, other things like building a granny flat, maybe renting by the room. So there's lots of things that you can do to massively increase your rental return. Again, it's not for everyone, but I've got clients who do it. We do it ourselves and substantially increases our rental return over and above what you could get or expect in a unit. Mm, that is good insight. And Forgive me for anchoring on just the one thing you said about flipping units. I find that so interesting that people have that as an investment strategy because it seems yeah. like what you could do to a unit is – it is a lot more limited to what you could do to a house, yeah. right? So the yeah. idea that you could with with stamp duty yes. on top of this and capital Legal gains fees. tax, you could really make a lot of money by by flipping units. So, but no, yeah. great insight. And, and if you are looking to rent best, I think those are those are fantastic ideas that Greg brought up. Um, you know, working quite intimately in Brisbane, are there any areas that are performing particularly well at the moment? Yeah. Okay, great question, Liam. So. Every month, 
Hey, Dad, or CoreLogic puts out their monthly chart, housing chart pack. So I read that religiously monthly. And what that data is showing at the moment and has historically shown, and I'm, I'm a big believer in this, is that, you know, if you're all looking to invest, so again, this is different to buying your own home and living where you want to live. This is just purely talking numbers. Hmm. What the reports are showing and have shown for a very long time now is that affordable areas are outperforming the more blue chip areas. Right. As a percentage. So, you know, obviously if you if you bought a house in Double Bay or, or you bought a, a house in Hornsby, mm. you know, you're going to make more money in Double Bay, but you obviously need to put out five times the amount. Yeah. And your rental return is going to be lower. Yeah. So these reports are, all, are showing and have done for a long time is that the more affordable areas are making the best investment at the moment. Mm. So Brisbane itself is made up of five main councils. So Greater Brisbane, you've got Brisbane City Council right in the centre. Then on the north side, you've got Moreton Bay Council, and that's that's a, it's a great area to consider for investing. There's some great affordable property very close to the water. And like all the other councils, very limited availability of land. Yeah. Then on the western side, you've got Ipswich Council. That's probably the most affordable area in Brisbane. And then you've got Logan Council on the south, and then the south east, and you've got Redland Bay Council. Yeah. So Morton Bay Council, I really like Morton Bay Council for investors at the moment. It's just changed from Morton Bay Regional Council to Morton Bay City Council. There's a, a lot of infrastructure going in there. And just going back to what I was saying about the Olympics is that one of the best parts of any city getting the Olympics is the infrastructure that goes into that city and the jobs that it creates mm. over and above the Olympics. The Olympics are only there for three weeks. Mm. Uh, and the city will make a lot of money in that three weeks. But that's not the only reason that the Olympics are great for cities. It's mm. because of the infrastructure that goes in there. And Brisbane or southeast Queensland has the largest infrastructure spend in Australian history happening right now, yeah. right up till 2031. So yeah. lots of new things going in there, lots of employment. Mm. Uh, well, 2031. And, so it's, it's a quite a steady seven-year kind of pipeline of projects. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah, and, and then some no major up getting the five hundred million dollars stadium announcements and yes. new metro lines and new train lines to accommodate all the people coming yep. through the Olympics. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, new universities and yeah. Are there any areas that are performing less well than we would have expected according to the data? Look, Brisbane in general. So look, and and I'll just make it clear to everyone that yeah, Perth has outperformed Brisbane mm. capital growth wise. Yeah, has done. My personal opinion is that you know it's still doing very well in the short term, medium to longer term. I feel Brisbane does offer better opportunity, mm. but we've been buying for ourselves and for clients in Brisbane for well fifteen years, and for a long period, Brisbane units were really suffering. There was a huge oversupply of units, yeah, and um, they suffered capital growth wise for a very long time. Mm. But just in the last few years, we've we've seen even units perform very well in Brisbane. So yeah. um, nowhere really that I would say steer away from. The the things you do, there's a lot you need to consider when you invest in Brisbane. And I'm sure everyone probably knows the biggest thing you need to be aware of is flooding. Yes. Lots of Brisbane floods. And you can see two houses on the same street and they're two, three, four hundred thousand dollars apart in sale price, purely because one floods and the other one's on the high end of the street and it doesn't flood. So, And we're talking like a couple hundred metres from each other. Yeah, like 200 metres, 150 metres, and sometimes even just next door. Yep, that's pretty major. So this is where you have the benefit of working with buyers, agents such as yourselves with yep. this, right? Because if you're investing from Sydney and you don't have the time to allocate to go up and do the research and understand the area, yep. you actually really run the risk of buying something which might not give you great long-term yield or, or yeah. long-term capital growth. Absolutely. And look, investors, and you know, rightly so, they're always looking for a deal. Mm. Always looking to buy low, which, you know, I, I don't have an issue with. But what happens with that is you tend to buy assets that don't perform as well. Yep. And you risk, if unless you know how to do it, which, you know, there's free websites, free council websites you can go to. Anyone can look up, you know, the flood impact on any property. Mm. But, you know, those cheaper ones, it might look like a bargain. And I've actually had clients that have come to me after engaging another buyer's agent who was recommending flood affected properties to them. Wow. Yeah. And saying to the client, you know, you know this property is $30,000 under market value. So, well, it should be $150,000 under market value. 
Yeah, so 30,000 is quite marginal when you yeah, – Yeah, exactly. In the long run. Not to take anything away, there's a lot of great buyers, agents out there, but, um, you know, that is the number one check that we do, and not just in Brisbane either, you know. We work in the Newcastle area and there's a lot of flooding in Newcastle as well. Mm. There's a lot of things to consider, a lot of checks that we do. Mm. But, yeah, I'd say the biggest one for Brisbane is make sure that you're checking your flood maps. See, uh, it's, it's stay a good, away from it. <laughs> it's a good reminder. I mean, like in property, the ability for you to cut corners is actually quite minor because if you do cut the corner and say, oh, this mm. property is $30,000 under market value, oh, that's great. Right. But then when you factor 10 years down the horizon and whatever yeah. climate change may yield in the future, yeah. that could cost you several hundred thousand. And I oh, had a, right. um, a podcast last week talking about people that, used the best way to put like suboptimal builders and they yeah. went for the cheapest builder they could find and in the long run they, it cost them again hundreds and hundreds and hundreds yeah. of thousands of dollars because there's problems it's a good time to be reminded to just not cut yeah. corners you have to do the basic you have to do the research you have to understand what you're buying you yeah. have to partner with smart people whether it's a buyer's agent like yourself that understands the the brisbane market or an, a good broker or or a, just a good a team around you Absolutely. to make Make sure that you're you're getting something that's going to be good for the long term. Yeah, absolutely. I did a presentation a few weeks ago on on renovating for profit, mm. and um, you just reminded me it's a it's a great tip to pass on. Is that you know a lot of people overcapitalize when they renovate, mm. but the thing that you know is a huge pitfall and a huge risk is undercapitalizing as well. Coming back to your point, you know. Putting in Lemonex bench tops where you know that particular suburb really is is demanding stone. Yes. Yep. 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 So it's another another tip for your investors: don't overcapitalize, but don't undercapitalize. So yeah. do your market research. Look at what's selling. What you know? What's the what are the median wages for the suburb? What's the mm. median house price? It's, um, I mean, that goes back to the Double Bay example that you brought up before, yeah. right? If you if you were renovating somewhere in Double Bay, people would sniff it out from a mile away. That's if right. they're expecting to pay several million dollars for an asset, they're expecting to get a quality yeah. asset from it. Absolutely, yeah. Are there any Great other point. challenges at the moment that are creating hurdles for investors in the Brisbane market? Yeah. What's the DA situation like? What's yeah. all that looking like at the moment? Yeah. Look, I, I would say currently at the moment, you know, a lot of the properties that we're negotiating on, we're getting – four or five other people putting in offers. Yeah. So the best tip I can offer to anybody that's in that situation and there's multiple offers is build rapport with the agent. Mm. You know, a lot of a lot of buyers think that the agent is the enemy, whereas in fact they should flip their mentality and say the agent is their friend. They need to become friends with that agent. What I find, not just because I'm a buyer's agent, but because I'm good at building rapport with agents, but also because I'm a buyer's agent is that, build a lot of rapport and tend to find out a lot of information that they probably wouldn't share with the general public or the, you know, the general mum or dad buyer or general investor. So build rapport with the agent, get them on your side, because if it does come down to four or five offers, you want to give yourself the best opportunity to to negotiate and, and get the property. Mm. We've bought properties before at lower prices than some of the other offers, purely because we've offered the best terms. Mm. Find took the time to find out what the seller wanted, what was important to them. Do they want a short settlement, a longer settlement? You know, there's different clauses that you can add or take out of a contract to help with your negotiations. And we find that that really helps us with our negotiations. So that's the first one. As far as development goes, look, southeast Queensland are very progressive. Mm. You know, they've, obviously they've got character homes and heritage homes, but they are a progressive area. All their councils are quite progressive and open to development. Um, so I'm not finding any issues there really. So, yeah, I think that for me at the moment, the biggest thing is just having to negotiate when I know there's more than, you know, three or four other offers on the table. Yeah. We're going to a quick break and we'll be back in just a second. Liam Garman, Greg Vadillo here unpacking the Brisbane market and why so many investors are going to Brisbane and southeast Queensland and Greg, we touched on this a little bit before, but in terms of the Olympics, but I think there's a big question on everyone's mind whether now that Brisbane has overtaken Melbourne to be Australia's second most expensive city, if it's here to stay or whether it's going to be a blip. Yeah. Look, great question. Uh, I say this to all my clients. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't forecast, but I do follow a lot of economists and I follow a lot of property research analysts. 
Mm. And then I create an informed opinion, but it is just my opinion. Look, based on what I think is going to happen, Melbourne is forecast to be the biggest or the largest city in Australia Mm. for certain reasons, mainly land tax and a few other changes the governments have made there. Investors are leaving Melbourne in droves, which is why we've seen their prices in decline, the rental returns in decline. You know, the investors aren't getting the returns, they're not getting the same tax breaks, uh, mm. and they're having to pay more tax. Mm. So for that reason, people are leaving Melbourne. Mm. I feel like it's more of a medium-term issue, though. Yep. So with Melbourne being forecast as being Australia's largest city, I do feel like it will come back, and I do feel like it will overtake Brisbane eventually. Mm. If I was investing right now, I'd be definitely recommending or suggesting people research and investigate Brisbane. The other thing is Melbourne's traditionally had the lowest rental returns in Australia. Yeah. There's yeah. a lot of land supply there at the moment, a lot of, you know, townhouses and new apartments going up. So for the short term, I'd probably give Melbourne a miss. Obviously, do your own research and, <laughs> you know, make your own informed decisions. But based yeah. on my knowledge, uh, a, a person wouldn't be buying in Melbourne right now. Yeah. But in the medium term, say, you know, maybe five years, I'd probably reassess that. Three, four years might reassess it. Mm. But certainly for now, I just think the risk is is far too great. Mm. But long term, I think Melbourne's a great investment. Mm. I think that's a, that's a very common bit of feedback that we've heard a lot on this podcast, which is, yes, the Melbourne market has been cooling off for several years now almost, but mm. people still don't necessarily think it's at its lowest yet. There's still more to yeah. go. I think it seems reasonable because the increase in land tax is still a very recent policy. So That's when you right. had the increase in land tax coupled with higher interest rates, coupled even potentially mm. with uncertainty over negative gearing and capital gains tax, there still seems to be a little bit more give in that market to drop a little bit more. I agree. Yeah. So looking in terms of this, why is it so critical that investors work with a buyer's agent such as yourself when they're looking to, and this this could be broader, this could be talking about Melbourne or Perth that you touched yeah. on before or Brisbane. Why is it so important that people get surrounded by experts like yourselves and work with buyer's agents? It seems to me a pretty small cost for pretty long-term gain. Yeah. It's a great question. Thanks, Liam. Uh, look, there's lots of reasons people work with buyers agents. Lots of our clients come to us because they want to make an informed decision. Mm. And we've got all the tools and some of them, like RP data, is not cheap, quite expensive. We've got a, quite a few different tools that we use. We help our clients make an informed decision. And look, it's not necessarily about buying the cheapest property. As I said before, you know, you can buy the cheapest property if you want, but it could be a f- flood affected property that you can't develop. You, yeah. If you did do a knockdown rebuild, you've got to, I've seen properties in Brisbane where, you know, the first floor starts at about telegraph pole height because oh. that's at the flood level. Yeah. So there's all these steps all the way up because they, you know, they wanted to build a house and it was in a flood affected area. Mm. So making informed decisions is the first one. Making that decision based on data. So we provide our clients with a lot of data, but one of the biggest issues with data is understanding what it means Mm. And, you know, what are some thresholds like vacancy rate thresholds and what's a good rental yield? What isn't a good rental yield? Mm. But I'd say the biggest benefit is really the relationships that we have with agents. We get a lot of off-market properties. We get a lot of properties before they come onto the market. Mm. And because of that and because of the data and the relationships that we have, we can save our clients a lot of money. Mm. We take the stress out of it. Buying property, no matter how many experts you've got around you, there's certainly going to be some stress, but we certainly minimise that. Yeah. And then another massive benefit is the time. So Eubank did some research and they worked out that the average Australian takes six and a half months to buy a property. Our sort of median is probably six weeks. Yeah, um, wow. But we've bought properties for clients in less than one week. Mm. Last, is, is, last, it, is it wise to move that quickly? Look, it can be. And this is the thing, if, if an investor was starting their journey and just started looking at property for the first day, I wouldn't necessarily recommend jumping on the first property that you find. Mm. But I, I look at property every single day. So mm. when I see something that I think has got a huge amount of potential, or we call it a twist, so something a property has got a twist, there's something that you can do to the property to either one, increase the value, whether that's subdividing, renovating, building a granny flat mm. or increasing the rent, again, yep. through maybe renovations or, you know, adding a granny flat. 
Mm. So we, if I see property that's got a twist, yeah, I've been looking at properties for, I've now been licensed as a buyer's agent for 13 years. Yeah. So I've been looking at property for 13 years. So that's why I can confidently recommend a property to a client mm. in one day. However, if you're starting out, you really do need to do your research and sort of understand the market and what is a good price, what isn't a good price, and what's a good property, what's not a good property. So Advocate's been around for 13 years now. Yeah, we've been, I think, yeah, it's almost 13. I think it's 13. Yeah. Gosh, it's gone yeah. quick. I know, I know. And my first, my first real estate job, well, I did work experience in 1993. So, however long ago that is now. Yeah. Um, you do the I did work experience. Make you depressed. And then um, I worked for Ray White at Linfield. But they're not there anymore. They left quite a while ago. But that was my first real job in real estate in 1995. Yeah, wow. Yeah. That's and, funny. Um, yeah, left, left the industry for a while. Quick for um the advocate. I remember when you when you guys launched it. Yeah, it feels yeah. very recent. But you know, yeah. for people looking more broadly, I know we've touched on some of it. But top three tips, I guess, for people that are looking to go into the Brisbane market, rapid fire, yeah. Greg. What are they? Yeah, number one, just make sure you're not buying in a flood zone. That's number one. Number two, highly recommend if you can afford it, buy a house over an apartment. Mm. And number three is do your research, understand the area, look at comparable sales, what is um, property sold for that is quite similar to it in recent times, ideally at least in the last two to three months. That would be my top three tips. So, I mean, you know, like research research might be easier said than done for some people that, you know, yeah. they might be time poor or like you said, that RP data can be quite expensive. They might really only have realestate.com.au recently sold prices. How would you yep. go about doing that research to make sure that you're paying around market value? Yeah, uh, great question. So, it is another tip for you. Yeah, in, in Queensland, if a property is marketed without a price, the agent's not technically able to give you a price guide. Yeah. So tip number one, I always ask the agent, can you share with me the comparable sales that you're looking at for this property? Mm. That tells me two things. One, what the agent thinks it's worth, and two, what the seller thinks it's worth. Yeah. I then go and do my own, we we'll call it CMA, comparative market analysis in RP data, and I cross-reference and, and check that what they're looking at is the same as what we're looking at. So top tip there, if you if you don't have RP data, ask the agent and then have a look at real estate or domain because, you know, some properties are off market so you may not be able to see the property online. But yeah. You should be able to find some historical data on that property. Yeah, there'll be there'll be enough like properties out yeah. there to yeah. to go for. And the um it's a good reminder that if the if the price isn't listed that they're not really allowed to give you that price guide. It's a quite an yeah. odd quirky throwback, I think, policy. Yeah. But I mean there's also that risk that you kind of you'll get that chronic underquoting. So needing to yes. do the research is just the way to to balance it out. Greg, I think that is all we have time for today. Thank you so much Thank for joining you. us on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Liam. No, thank you. That was Greg Vadillo, co-owner and buyer's agent at Advocate Property Services. And that is all we have time for today on the Smart Property Investment Show. And we'll be back in just a few more days with another episode. But until then, bye-bye. The information featured in this podcast is general in nature and does not take into consideration your financial situation or individual needs and should not be relied upon. Before making any investment, insurance, tax, property or financial planning decision, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Guests appearing on this podcast may have a commercial relationship with the companies mentioned. Do you need help planning your next event? With over 15 years of experience, Captivate Events is the expert in event planning. Our dedicated team ensures every detail is meticulously handled. Whether it's a gala dinner, exhibition, conference or study tour, we've got you covered. We'll be there every step of the way, from conceptualisation to flawless execution, to ensure your event is a seamless experience, minimising the time and stress involved in planning. Make your next event one to remember. Visit www.captivateevents.com.au or call 02 8866 and find out how we can captivate your audience.